Welcome to the Ortho Joe Show, a joint production of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery and Ortho Evidence. In our world, orthopedic research is king, and current topics from our respective publications are analyzed weekly. Here is Mohit Bhandari from Ortho Evidence and Mark Swinkowski from the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery. Well, good morning, Mo and uh, Jay, and uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to introduce now the very first two-time Ortho Joe interviewee. Uh, and I, I think this is uh, befitting Dr. Jay Parvizi's status as a leader uh, in orthopedic knowledge acquisition and is befitting his motivation and his drive and his ability to organize people. So, uh, and uh, Jay, when we had you on before, you were just basically talking about the ICM process and how you select topics. And it was primarily focused on uh, PJI, prosthetic joint infection. And that was a great visit, but you've been back at it. We hinted at that uh, in, the, in the first conversation on Ortho Joe, and we wanna give you a chance to uh, talk about the latest uh, project. But uh, just a brief uh, introduction. Uh, Dr. Parvizi is the James Edward Professor of Orthopedics at Thomas Jefferson University and at Rothman. And uh, he really doesn't need any introduction to the majority of practicing orthopedic surgeons are around the world. So now, because you're the, uh, the, you know, normally we give people the ortho Joe mugs that Mo and I use to stay awake in the, in the, in the morning. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you got one. Yes, I do. Okay. So now the question is, did you get this model, uh, which no, is the... I or would, did you get this one? I model? got an upgraded model, Mark. I got Which the one? Uh, aluminum one, the black one. The black, you have the black one. Okay. Yes. So we can send you the lighter uh, transport model, which fits better in the cup holder of your car. So uh, look for that uh, as a small token of our appreciation. And uh, this is really my first one this morning. Uh, Mo, I don't know. You, you, I don't even sure you drink coffee, to be honest. Oh, I drink coffee. I drink coffee. But, you know, I just throw up the day, kind of sip away. Yeah. So it's all good. Yeah, good. Okay. So, Jay, um, you were very kind to thank us for uh, at JVJS for publishing uh, part sections of the PGI work that you did. But this go around, uh, we worked with you from the, from the early stages of the VTE project to get the whole thing as a supplement. So, uh, we're very grateful that you chose uh, JVJS as a venue, but uh, maybe you can just uh, tell our audience uh, why VTE. Uh, I mean, that's probably a dumb question. I mean, we're all we're all well aware of uh, the potential catastrophic impact of such a, such a problem. But what, why did you decide after PJI to go after this topic? Sure. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for your uh, kind comments, and thank you uh, for allowing me to be part of the. Uh, interview and Mo, great to see you as well. Obviously, the, uh, the issues that we deal with in orthopedics uh, and what bothers our patients are important for us as well. Clearly, two of those would be infection and venous thromboembolism because both of those potentially have fatal outcome and huge morbidity associated with them. And uh, venous thromboembolism after orthopedic procedures is thought to be a common uh, risk or complication. And in the absence of really um, proper global guidelines, we felt that there was, a, there was a need for a comprehensive guideline that covered all surgical specialties in orthopedics, not just hip and knee replacement, which most of the guidelines apply to. And uh, then we started that process, as you know, we talked about it last time, and we're really grateful to JBJS and the team that they provided us. That whole process took a year, and now we have it available. So to answer the question is, I think it's because one of, one of the most concerning complications after orthopedic procedures, and we really owe it to our patients to have our arms around this issue, knowing how to prevent it or minimize its, uh, its impact on our patients. Yeah, Jay, that's a great point uh, that you made uh, in your introductory comments that most of what we have is in uh, arthroplasty literature and very little uh, in, in, the, in the other areas like pediatrics, for example, 
uh, and to a limited degree sports. So I think this is a great service to the orthopedic community. And maybe can you can you just talk a little bit about how you select people to participate uh, in uh, in ICM processes and in this one in particular? Sure, we stick to the strict Delphi process, and uh, Delphi obviously includes selection of delegates, expert delegates. We define the expert delegates, we being the steering committee that was involved, and I want to thank them uh, for guiding this whole process. People who have published at least three to five um, articles related to the subject as a first or last author, society nominations, uh, society considering them as being experts in the field of VT. And then finally, we're there were some residents and fellows that were recruited by some of the delegates to do some of the heavy lifting of uh, systematic review process. So we basically, uh, the 600 or so delegates that are part of the ICM VTE were selected uh, through that one of the three criteria that I just mentioned. Jay, from your perspective, I mean, obviously you, you've um, um, been part of the steering committee, you've led this work. Were there any big surprises for you, um, you know, in this? And I mean, I'm certainly not asking to rehash the results per se in this forum. I encourage all of those who are listening to, you know, go to the site and make sure they get a chance to, to look at the recommendations. But was there something in your mind that says either this is where we have to go next or this was a surprise that we did not anticipate we'd find based on, you know, the, the process itself? Yeah, Mo, there were like two or three surprise, surprises as in like uh, uh, maybe a uh, uh, something that really informed me, great new knowledge. One of them is that intermittent compression devices, the mechanical prophylaxis. It's amazing how much literature there is related to intermittent compression devices, some level one studies. And it looks like it works in uh, most of the subspecialties. Um, I wasn't surprised to see that aspirin uh, did not make it to the field of major trauma and also in spine. They still feel that low molecular weight heparin is the best option for those categories of patients. Again, that's because of lack of evidence or lack of publications related to those two areas. And uh, the third is actually in the tumor world. I was very pleasantly surprised to see that the tumor experts felt that aspirin or the milder form of anticoagulation is okay for those patients because most of the time we consider as patients with active cancer as very high risk for uh, VTE. But fortunately there was enough evidence for them to, to suggest aspirin. For the most of the other areas and like hip and knee replacement, et cetera, it looked like majority of the patients would be good candidates for receiving aspirin with or without the intermittent compression devices. Hmm, interesting. So, I mean, from your perspective, and, and this has been sort of what I've seen happen in, in you know, in, in just general in the cardiovascular world, which is there's been such a huge uh, industry influence over decades where, you know, millions, if not tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars have been put into trials trying to sort things out uh, with, you know, more complex, fancier, novel therapeutics. But when you look at the data, you're even suggesting, and sometimes it's some of the more simpler strategies that we might consider simpler uh, continue to have you know, a place in, in the management of VTE. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know this better than anybody in terms of how difficult these randomized prospective studies are. And the randomized prospective studies that are available in the literature, majority uh, of them are industry-sponsored clinical trials that were done not to purely generate science. In fact, I will argue it was purely for the purpose of getting the agency, FDA or other regulatory agencies approve their drug. They needed to do those studies in order to get approval for their medication. Obviously aspirin, nobody's really gonna be spending enough time or money to do these randomized prospective studies. But having said that, a lot of investigators and incredible scholars have done so. In fact, that Canadian study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine, there's another study that just came out in JAMA. Uh, Dr. Beccatini was supposed to be with us today, Cecilia Beccatini from Italy. She has published multiple randomized prospective studies where aspirin has been compared to the 
more potent anticoagulants. Uh, so the older literature of the 80s and 90s is all on molecular weight heparin and similar drugs where industry had to do them as part of their regulatory process. But in recent decades, we are seeing a lot of great evidence emerge in favor of aspirin, at least showing that aspirin is not inferior to other anticoagulants available today. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, adding a little bit from the trauma world, uh, Bob O'Toole uh, from Shock Trauma has got a very, very large trial that the data has been locked now and, and is being analyzed for publication on uh, major pelvic uh, and acetabular trauma, lower extremity trauma, comparing aspirin to the, to the other types of anticoagulation. So we'll have some better information in uh, trauma as well. So let me ask you, uh, uh, Jay, so some of these areas, subspecialty areas in our field, really there's hardly anything. Like I'm just thinking peds and, and, and hand and wrist. So did, did you have trouble finding delegates to participate in those areas? Yeah, we did. There were not that many delegates who've, who've got published expertise in the field. And that's why we relied on the societies to nominate uh, experts in their area, people who have expressed interest or have been involved in the uh, VTE related research. As you know, Mark, we have 135 societies that were part of this ICM VTE, and each society nominated two delegates. So about 270, half of the delegates that we have on the ICM VTE came from society nominations. So they may or may not have had publications, but they were definitely people interested in the area. And the hand, hand was actually very, very impressive, incredibly engaged, very, very, all of the delegates were, but I, for hand, as you said, it was particularly a challenging one because they really don't have much publications related to VTE prevention. And uh, yet in some parts of the world, uh, there is a tendency or at least the impression that you should be administering VTE prophylaxis even after minor procedures like carpal tunnel release. Hmm. Very interesting. How do people access the uh, information? So I, I, I know at uh, JBGS, it's, it's under collections on the, on the jbgs.org website, but uh, you have an app, right? And uh, uh, just tell, tell our listening uh, public how, how to access the information. Mm. Yeah, uh, again, I really can't thank JBJ's team enough. I know that huge number of uh, your uh, team worked very, very hard to get this published on a timely manner. It went through intensive uh, review beforehand and uh, the entire document, which includes every subspecialty in orthopedics, some of which we've already mentioned, but a sports, spine, for example, 10, all the 10 subspecialties, each of them have their document published uh, separately. All of them are in JVJS, and JVJS is providing access to these documents free of charge. So the best is really to access that link that we have, because the whole document can be accessed and uh, I even believe downloaded from JVJS. There is a printed version of the document for those people who prefer to see the printed version, which we have available and happy to send to anybody who wishes to have them. And then, as you know, there's been multiple uh, delegates from various countries that are translating this to numerous languages. Societies are also posting the document and or the link to the JVJS document on their websites. And uh, we have at least 60 societies that have endorsed it, but many more uh, going to bring it to their board during their annual meeting, which has taken place. And then uh, finally, as you mentioned, we have an app, which is uh, called ICM Philly. And that app houses the whole document, which is uh, again, free of charge, accessible. And then the app also has a uh, couple of other sub apps, if you like, one of them, which is the VTE risk calculator, which was the result of a work in which we're trying to identify the risk for VTE versus risk for major bleeding. So if you have a situation in which you can't decide which form of anticoagulant to administer, you might be interested in using that app to give you some guidance. Thanks. That's, that's a very useful tool and uh, grateful for our patient public that you're making this readily available. So Mo, I got a question for you. So this, this is a different type of information 
really than OE has uh, mm -hmm. invested so much of its uh, time in. So what are your thoughts about uh, this type of consensus uh, document in, in terms of your intense effort and desire to provide the highest evidence possible? Yeah, I mean, to Jay's point, I mean, I think what he's openly and pretty explicitly said is that they are culling all of the randomized trials of the highest quality evidence. The challenge we face is that the perception is, um, and I take part, I mean, I take a very small part of that, you know, I'm a big, I'm a small part of that big problem that is out there that says, well, it's only, it's only valuable if it's a randomized trial. But Mark, you and I know, and Jay certainly knows, there are, as you mentioned, there's multiple areas where we absolutely need other forms of evidence for sure. And in the area of VTE, while I suspect there's lots of great high quality randomized data, which I'm almost positive informed of the decisions of this consensus group, there were probably areas where their expertise was critically important. And, um, you know, and I, the document itself is pretty explicit about where they got the information, and how those decisions were made. So the thing I love about it is it's very transparent and you know exactly where the information came from. I don't know, JP, anything else to add to that? But well, absolutely true. And of course, we all feel like randomized perspective studies, high level of evidence is much more valuable than observational studies or expert opinion. But to your point, Mo, in some of the areas that Mark also mentioned, like pediatrics, for example, mm -hmm. or even uh, spine, there is so little information on VTE prevention. So what was happening was that the standard of care was all over the place, yeah. all over the place. And people were doing what they felt was right for their patients. But in the process, we could have ended hurting the patients. So in the absence of evidence in some of these areas, that's where I think the Delphi process becomes very important. We decide what is best right now based on available evidence, but we also identify the areas of need of evidence and try to really focus our energy and efforts to try to generate evidence in some of those areas. So this at least brings us all to be singing out the same hymn book, but possibly moving into future, we do need to uh, identify areas in need of research. And I know, I mean, just Mark mentioned that bubble tools study, that's fabulous. I know Australians are doing the randomized perspective studies. At least we know what the current recommendation and standard of care is. And then we move and broaden that down the line by generating more evidence. I totally agree. And by the way, this uh, document, uh, Mark, obviously, you know, because you read every single one of those, every single publication related to the field of VTE was reviewed and is cited in the documents. So we do not overlook any studies, particularly, obviously, level ones. Um, we looked at every single pub uh, publication in English language related to VTE. We had the Cochrane Group help us identify the wall. We had multiple librarians, numerous by statisticians from New York and Philadelphia. So this was done, the systematic review was done in a proper fashion. It wasn't like I sat there and I decided what was uh, appropriate to include and what wasn't. The mesh terms, for example, were developed by the Cochrane Group. This was communicated to all the delegates. The publications were pulled. We helped them sometimes getting access to the full papers, and then they are all cited and their shortcomings as well as their strength all mentioned. Great. Uh, Jay, can you just uh, uh, tell our listening public, what, what are your thoughts about updating uh, this work and the PJI work? Yeah, so we've been having PJI uh, meetings every five years. The next one should have been in 2023. Uh, we're waiting to see if there has been enough publications in the last few years to really make that uh, a worthwhile effort. Uh, if it was, if uh, my personal opinion is that we probably should delay it to 2025. That will give us a few more years of data and evidence, particularly right now we're going through a very, very exciting period with uh, PJI World. A huge number of randomized prospective studies are underway great deal of developments on the industry side, industries paying attention to this field at last. So feeling is that the infection one would be done in 2025. Yeah. Good, and then so probably a three to five year gap on the VTE, something like that? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. 
Well, Mo, uh, do you have a last uh, question for Jay before I ask him my last one? Well, the only thing I would say, Jay, is that you know you you looked at PGI, you've looked at VTE. Certainly, you're probably looking ahead into the future and thinking about how you can use the same uh, you know approaches you been so successful in the past. Are there areas in your mind that you're thinking of exploring? Well, one other area that I think is worth looking at for us in the future is pain management. That's another area which is all over the place and it's been incredible. We've made so much, so many strides in those days of PCA and giving people a huge amount of narcotics. We've shifted away. So it would be wonderful to have a consensus on um, pain management. Uh, for hips, knees, and for all other subspecialties. That's an area, but it's really out of my realm of expertise. Not that I'm an expert in infection or VT either, but we could potentially try to get together another ICM to try to look into pain, or perhaps some of the anesthesia societies could potentially take this on. It would be fantastic to have a proper standard of care for pain management. Yeah, hugely important area. Uh, that that would be uh, a a great effort. We we published a uh, symposium that we we brought together all of the researchers, both on the clinical side and the large database side, and published some guidelines for for doing the best research design in pain management in 2019. And hopefully, some individuals have have brought that brought that into their uh, design toolbox, and and maybe we'll have some better information. Uh, to uh, work with. Well, that was my question, uh, Jay, because uh, I know, I, even though you're a very good golfer, I've played with you, I, uh, I am <laughs> quite sure that you're not going to stop working hard on, on clinical issues that are of extreme importance to our patients uh, and our, our practitioners. And um, I, I, I couldn't see you playing uh, three to five rounds a, a week. I, I, I knew you're, you're you're back at it uh, in some way or, or fashion, in addition to being a surgeon and you're in the OR, and I'm uh, sorry we, we drug you away from, from a surgical case, but uh, thanks so much for allowing us to uh, have you uh, update our listening public on where you are with this monumental effort with VTE. Mm. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Mo. And Thanks, it's Jay. a pleasure to be on this interview. Uh, you're very kind. Hopefully we get the chance to play golf but you're too kind about my golf skills. I usually <laughs> use my clubs like a shovel on the course. You know, we should get JBJF golf balls for Jay. That's what we should get next time we see you. How's that? <laughs> hey, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll get uh, Christina. I'm sure she's on that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. All right. Well, thanks very much, Jay. Uh, thanks, Thank Mo, and have a great day. Uh, Jay, you'll get this you one. So uh, have a great day. Cheers, guys. All right. See ya. Bye-bye. Oh, Bye-bye.